My name is Jason Rice. I am a web applications programmer. Um, I'm a bit burned out on that, though, so I've been investing pretty heavily the last few years in C++, even web applications in C++. Uh, this talk has nothing to do with the web, so don't freak out. Uh, but there is a common pattern. Um, and it's not just the web, but the, uh, the internet in general. Uh, and the pattern is request reply. Uh, it's typically over HTTPS. Um, and oftentimes, it's what they call REST, which is stateless. And they separate the types of data um, by using different um, network endpoints. So like uh, even at the application level, they do dispatching. Um, so the problem with that is, um, let's say you have a view or let's say a web page or something that has a bunch of different types of information that would result in multiple of, of these. Uh, is that door locked? Yeah, just get the All right. I think I did that last year. <laughs> All right. So um, the problem with that is it, it results in um, multiple request replies over this text protocol um, to create this one view. And um, the information can go stale. So every time they load that view, they tend to make the same requests over again. And uh, I've even, in, um, uh, at a company I worked at, there was an example where somebody was getting an object that had nested in it a list of other objects. And that list didn't have enough information in each element, so they would call another request to get more information about that particular element. And they were doing filtering on the client side. And it turned out that they were literally making 30,000 requests to get this view that was later filtered on the client side uh, of seven elements. And it took like 30 seconds to load. So it was obviously pretty inefficient. Um, that's an extreme case. But uh, I think we can do better by uh, using a full duplex. Like, let's say you have a single connection, and you get uh, as much information up front as you can. And then you can keep that information from going stale by sending messages about changes in state. Uh, uh, so the request reply model, um, the, the code that did the 30,000 requests, the code was actually really beautiful. Uh, but the problem was is that their method of abstraction used a physical network um, I.O. And uh, so what I, I'm setting out to achieve, and the reason I picked C++, um, well, with the network, I, I believe that you know, when you have a big team that all, all has a hand in the code, they, uh, they, uh, they use the physical network to enforce separation. So, um, so people can't possibly uh, you know, violate that separation. So the reason I pick C++ is that you can use the same, you know, it's the, the, the type system. Um, it has a powerful and uh, flexible type system that you can use to create the same enforcement of separation. But C++ offers a zero cost abstraction, or at least close to zero cost in some cases, um, versus the abstraction over a physical uh, network. So that's the idea uh, that I'm trying to achieve with this. This is specifically on full duplex. Uh, communication and creating a, a generic interface that you can use to compose uh, different protocols and uh, to create a, an endpoint that's not only composable, but it's also a facade layer that hides a lot of the complexities of the lower level, like ASIO and Beast WebSocket um, interface, as well as it, it also handles some of the, uh, the ownership issues with uh, object lifetimes in C++, which can be very, uh, it can be a pitfall for users who who aren't initiated uh, with using ASIO, um, like using um, shared pointers and whatnot. All right. So here's a, an overview. We'll start out with uh, looking at generic network programming. There's a couple of libraries that exist in the wild today that provide um, varying degrees of generalization for communicating um, in a full duplex interface. Uh, we'll take a look at object lifetime management. Um, and the problem in C++ with asynchronous calls and keeping those objects alive until they're complete. Um, we'll also look at a, a promise interface. This is kind of like uh, what is being used to make these full duplex endpoints composable. 
Um, and last year I did a talk uh, on my library, Nibdol, which is the state management library, and it had a promise interface. Um, but since then I've made a clean break and I have uh, a new library called Full Duplex that uh, re-implements these promises as um, a proper or it's usable as a HANA monad. Uh, and I'll show that to you. And then um, after that, we'll go into uh, asynchronous queuing. Um, so when you do communication, like let's say you're writing to a, a, some socket and you, you're sending messages and that have to wait on I.O., you have to have a place to stick all these messages. And they typically use a local queue, but we can also provide an interface for having queues that involve I.O. And I'll show you the reason for that later. And then uh, finally, we'll end on the actual um, endpoint composition and the, uh, the, the end user interface. All right. So um, for those who don't know what full duplex communication is, uh, request replies, you send data across the socket, and you wait for a response. And typically, when you receive that response, the connection ends. That's typically how it goes. Uh, with full duplex communication, you can use a single connection to send messages and read messages in two separate channels that are completely orthogonal to each other. So uh, it's kind of like you can think of it as a range of, uh, or a series of events or, or messages uh, that happen over a period of time. And one thing that's worth noting is that these arrows, um, so when you read a message, you're mapping from the low level to the high level. So low level being like the low level socket implementation to a raw buffer, and then high level going into the object that the user wants to work with. And then with writes, the object or the, the user provides some high level object that can then get serialized, put into a buffer, and then sent over the socket. So that is a mapping of high level to low level. Right. And if anybody has any questions or statements or corrections or anything, feel free to just participate during the time. No need to save it for the end. All right, generic net network programming. Um, so this is the OSI model. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, at the very bottom, low level, you have physical bits being sent across fiber or wireless or even blinky lights. Um, and then typically you have like um, some really low level data framing um, uh, at the data link layer. And then IP, and then your transport, which is your socket, like TCP implementation. Or in a um, session, usually involves like, uh, um, you know, maintaining a connection so you can um, communicate um, more than just, you know, a single byte or whatever. And then presentation layer, they typically add something like compression or encryption. And then at the application layer, you have HTTP, WebSockets, um, and others. Uh, and this is uh, the interesting thing about this is that all of these can do any of the stuff that the other ones can do. So like, for instance, encryption um, can happen um, even at the IP level. They have IPsec that involves encryption. Mm -hmm. So that hides it all the way down in the network layer. And then there's also obviously the set, um, presentation layer where SSL handles encryption uh, seamlessly on top of the socket. And um, I would say there's even use cases for encryption at the application level as well. Um, also, like data framing, for instance, um, low level data framing here. So, uh, you know, so two different computers aren't like sending same, this, um, bytes at the same time, so they have discrete like packets or whatever data frames. But also, like let's say even in the application level, there's WebSockets. It has its own data framing, and um, like the the TCP sockets, they have they have packets that are discrete in size. But with the WebSockets, um, that can be a, a WebSocket data frame can be consist of multiple TCP packets, and multiple frames can make up a single message. So oftentimes, on top of the application layer in the actual like application, uh, you would have some means of having a discrete. You could call it, you could call it a data frame. I'd call it a message that is made up of multiple application layer frames. So, um, so yeah. So here's an example of a 
full duplex interface in the wild now, um, an open source library called Micro WebSockets. And actually, <laughs> I type MicroSockets. It's Micro WebSockets. Um, and uh, the interface is, so you have this um, hub object that has this uh, a way of providing callbacks to handle certain events. And, and the one I'm showing here is on message. So when it receives a message, um, the, the user can decide what they want to do with that information. Um, in, in this case, it's just sending information back. Uh, it has other hooks for different types of events, like on connection um, and on error. And an interesting thing about this particular library is the on message, or any of these callbacks, uh, you can register multiple callbacks for the same event. So like you'd have H on message here, and then another one H on message after that. So there would be two handlers that are orthogonal to each other handling the same event. And what that says about the interface, I don't even have to look at the implementation, but you can imagine that they have some kind of runtime list on runtime anonymous functions uh, in its implementation. So the interface says something about uh, its the amount of code it would generate or how efficient it would be, although it's probably, for most use cases, um, just fine. But there's no reason to say that you couldn't say on message, do something, and do something else in a single composed function. So as far as generic code, uh, the micro WebSockets library, uh, the extent of its um, ability to customize what socket layer you might want to use or what event handler is, is using a define. So this is a very uh, C, with C, C with classes type of library, although it does use lambdas and whatnot. But you, know, you can say use ASIO if you want to use ASIO with its TCP, or libuv, or even just its own implementation of a standalone ePoll uh, reactor. So the, the choices are limited, but it is simple to use for certain types of users, I guess. Um, Here is another full duplex library. Um, it is a C++ client for RabbitMQ. So this is like kind of like a, its own asynchronous queue that runs on another, you know, possibly another server, and it uh, keeps messages reliable. Um, and this one has a very similar interface, although for customization, it uses the common uh, inheritance and virtual function uh, method of providing hooks. And this one was nice enough to add an on data uh, event so that you can decide uh, how, what socket or how you want to write. You don't even have to use a socket if you don't want to. Um, how you want to write data. So, so the thing with this library and the other library is that it's very specific to the protocol. So the other one being web sockets and this one being uh, AMQP um, and specifically a RabbitMQ client. So it, it, it get, just gives you the information. You can be completely agnostic of what it is, but just send it over a socket that's connected to a RabbitMQ instance. So that's, that's a, a step in the right direction. But yeah, like I said, it's, it's still tied into a specific protocol. So each of these libraries have their own interface where you have to, to make uh, implementations to, to hook in to your, specific, your favorite socket implementation. So, Here's the one that I'm proposing, uh, a generic endpoint. And really, this is more like a, I originally called this endpoint class. Um, so it's like a specification of how an endpoint should behave. And it uses a named parameter in interface, uh, similar to like if you've seen Dino, or uh, it's using a HANA map on the, on the back end. But so you have an init um, uh, event, a read message, and a write message, and there's also a, an, a, an error event. And instead of just being um, like a lambda that's a callback, in this case, it's a lambda that receives a state object, and it's actually more, I should have changed this to say self. So the endpoint is an object uh, that you can access from within these handlers so that you can access things like the socket. Um, I didn't, I actually made it capture this state value um, after the fact. It's, it's not the best. Um, another option would be to have the, the internal lambda handle uh, um, or you know, in, take a, the socket, or not the socket, the endpoint object 
like injected it into the to this uh, this function inside. But in this case, uh, we just get stuck with the reference capture, which might be trivial, but I would like to eventually fix it. Um, so these are functions that take a state object and they return a promise object. In this case, tap returns a promise that does nothing more than side effects on its input value. Um, and then here, the right message is just do and it doesn't do anything. All right, so the state object is something that's owned by this endpoint object. Um, And it can have anything you want. Um, in this case, it's a socket because that's useful. And um, just as an example, maybe the, uh, the application wants to be able to track some session token or something like that. And so you take this endpoint, and you can compose it using endpoint compose. And in this example, uh, it composes a WebSocket client with my own handling stuff. And all I do is I give it a, the state object and a queue. And like I said, you have to have some kind of local queue to, uh, to buffer messages. But this queue gets automatically wrapped in an asynchronous queue interface. But the default is basically standard queue, uh, if, if you don't need IO in your queuing. <laughs> and that's zero cost. All right. so. Looking at object lifetime management in C++, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, when a, an object goes out of scope in the, like, let's say the scope of a function, it'll automatically get destroyed. And this can be a problem with uh, asynchronous programming where, you, let's say you have a function that returns some kind of event handler. And if you create a string on the stack, and in your event handler, you capture it by reference. When that function is finished being called, it gets destroyed. Um, so you're left with a dangling ref uh, You captured a dangling reference in your event handler. Your event handler gets called in some other context down here. And uh, bad things happen. Uh, in this case, this was like uh, I had to use std string to repro reproduce undefined behavior pretty consistently, but uh, what it would do is print out a bunch of garbage um, because the object's been destroyed. And it's pointing to something else in the heap. Um, so there's the, this concept of self-ownership. Um, and this is a really simple example of just this self-deleting object that you have to create using new, but it provides a done function that the user can call, or maybe not the user, but some implementation can call when some asynchronous action is done, and it deletes itself. So <clears throat> delete this is actually not so uncommon in network programming, but people typically shirk at the idea of raw new and raw delete. Uh, but if it isn't ex exposed to the, the user and used in an ad hoc manner, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, so let's say you have a series of events. Hold on a sec. And let's say the series of events is called by or handled by some object that owns itself. You can have this, this one big green object that calls each asynchronous action in series. Um, and when it's done, it can delete itself. And the thing is, like with ASIO, you give it uh, event handlers. Like, let's say you want to write. You have an event handler that, that gets called when it's done writing. Or if you have a read, you have an event handler that gets called when it receives something, um, basically when the event is done. Uh, in this case, um, you only ever have one outstanding event handler. So with ASIO, if you give ASIO an event handler, it will own it, and it will most guaranteed, I believe, it will definitely call that callback. So uh, um, if you close the socket, it usually calls it with um, an error of operation aborted. But this isn't guaranteed because the event could have al already occurred, and it's waiting in the queue to be called. So you could close the socket uh, 
and then the event handler would be called after the socket was closed and possibly whatever object that owns it is destroyed and then you'd have undefined behavior with that. Right? So this is where an example where this uh, self-ownership is feasible because you only have one event handler. But if you have two, in the case of full duplex, you have a read handler and a write handler at least. Um, and you can see that each of them have to use the socket and each of them can end in a, in a situation or they can create a situation that would terminate or you would want to close the socket and destroy everything that owns it because you're done with that connection. So in this case, you have what they call uh, shared ownership. Um, so you can see here the, the read handler and the write handler both have to own the socket somehow, <laughs> right? And um, as is typical, if you look through Asia's um, examples, you'll see uh, this uh, typical uh, way of handling that with STD enabled shared from this. And what that does is it creates a shared, or you, you create a shared pointer of this writer object, and it has the ability to, within itself, create a, another shared instance of itself using this shared from this function. And in this case, I'm giving it to the lambda by value, so it owns it. And even though I don't actually use it, because I can just pass this as well, um, at least it, it keeps it alive, so the reference count stays up. And when the event handler is destroyed, then the reference count gets decremented and your, your, uh, your whole endpoint possibly gets destroyed. So this way you can have a read handler and event handler both outstanding at the same time. And uh, um, neither of them, the, the last one that gets called will be destroyed. And the reason for that is because the event handlers, are, uh, the order in which they'll be called destroyed is not deterministic. All right, promises. <laughs> so uh, last year in my talk, I gave uh, a talk about a library nibdle that had promises in it, and all it was was a means of chaining asynchronous oper operations, but there was a problem with it um, that I eventually solved by create, using a new uh, an additional layer of indirection, uh, and uh, I, I was able to implement it as a HANA monad, which made it a lot easier to use uh, as far as composing operations go. Um, so something that's just probably trivial for everyone in this room, but understand that things can be, things are dependent, like in this example with this function, the value that's returned is dependent on the value of x, and the type um, that's returned is dependent on the type of x. And for any um, given type input, you always have to, say, have to have the same output type. So um, if you wanted to have a runtime condition that could create an error, you could not return an error type unless you implemented some kind of a variant or uh, a sum type, uh, which would have to have encoded in it some runtime information that would say whether or not it's an error. Um, and just to build up to this, uh, we'll start simple with some really basic function composition. So we have three functions, foo, bar, and baz. They do trivial things, um, doubling, um, uh, decrement, and then printing something out and just returning the value, which is effectively like a tap. And then to compose these functions, uh, manually, it would look like this. So you have uh, basically the orders reversed of what most people would expect, so it's not sequential. The first function that's evaluated is the innermost function, and that's foo. Uh, and its return value gets passed to bar, and the return value of that is uh, input into baz. So uh, as far as error handling goes, it would have to, have to use a sum type, like I said. Um, and then the output would be 83 in this case. So to get around the having to have an intermediate sum um, variant or sum type, um, I'm using callbacks. So in this case, this foo function uh, is a high order function that takes a callback called resolve, and it returns a lambda that captures the callback and it takes the input value and instead of returning a value it calls the callback with its result. 
All right? So is this like really obvious to everyone here? Or? All right. And then, uh, so the bar is the same thing, only uh, it can ex um, create a runtime error. Or there's a condition that could result in an error that happens at runtime. In this case, we don't want values over 50 for some arbitrary reason. And if it's over 50, over 50, instead of resolving x, we can resolve an error type that says that it's out of range. All right? Um, and here's the bands one. It's effectively a tap. It just prints a value and it resolves x. So the composition of these callback taking higher order functions is actually now it's sequential in that um, it goes foo, bar, then baz, and it ends with a no-op because they're modeled to have to take a callback. And uh, in this case, we're using these callbacks to do some kind of side effect at the end. In this case, it's a no-op. But the way it gets call evaluated is that foo is evaluated first. So its input receives five. And then it resolves its output to bar, and bar receives that input, and it's evaluated. And the, res the result of that goes to baz, and then eventually um, no op would receive the final result and do nothing. Is everybody following along so far? All right. Um, so in this case, there's two examples. One receives five, and it would output 10. And then the other one receives 42, but ev eventually, um, um, I guess it would be over 50 when you double it. So uh, it outputs an error value. So we took two different types and printed them out. Um, and that's it, without any kind of sum type. The, the problem with this is that the compile times could get kind of heavy. But for the use case of full duplex communication, it's not so bad. You don't typically have a chain of 20, 20 of these, uh, these callbacks. Um, although some of the other stuff, not, not asynchronous communication, but some stuff that I'm doing does have pretty long chains kind of like this. And uh, maybe they're only 20 or 30 long, but they get called a lot. And I have some, some uh, applications that take minutes to compile because of that. And I think the reason is, is that with each layer, you get a, a larger symbol. And uh, there's something to do with the IO and the optimizer, because that's where all the time is spent in optimization uh, with these really large symbols. All right, so instead of using callbacks, we could implement this as a promise. Um, so the problem that we had before with our com composition of these callback objects is that if we were to take the result of one of these, this composed object f, and we wanted to compose it with another one g at the end, this uh, right, adding it to the right hand side, uh, how would you go about doing that? Uh, and the answer is you would have to go all the way down into it. Well, no, you couldn't. And in, in this case, I don't think you can. It's impossible because you, you lose, Baz is owned by bar and foo, and you, you lose that information. Uh, well, actually, no, you don't lose the information. So, so foo, sorry, foo um, owns bar, which owns Baz, which owns the no op. And this is what it looks like. So you have this big blue blob, and uh, the tail is E. So that's the last event that gets called. And then every preceding event has a more complicated type. So D owns E, C owns D, which owns E, and then B owns C, which owns D, which owns E. And you can see how you know, these types are growing ever larger the longer, uh, the longer this gets. So in this case, how do you add something to E? You, you actually can, but you'd have to recursively go down into this structure, which is expensive in itself. And, but what that would do is it would effectively, effectively change the type of E, which would change the type of D, which would change the type of C, which would change the type of B, which would change the type of A. That is really expensive. 
So there's a lot of intermediate um, types being created. And it was also not something I wanted to try, even try coding. Um, so I'll refer to this as the big blue blob. Uh, it's just a big object that is basically recursive. So to make this easier, what I did is this is the additional layer of indirection. So instead of storing it as this big blue blob, I would store each object in a tuple. And, and this is like a sequence A, B, C, D, E. And then when I actually wanted to do the execution, then I would transform it into the big blue blob, and it's completely hidden from the user. And the reason, the reason we want to transform it to the big blue blob is that when you're doing asynchronous calls, you, you kind of want one object to own them all. And if you were to compose A, B, C, D, and E, as they're being executed, you, at least when I did it, uh, I would always end up with some kind of intermediate thing, like a lambda. And it would capture a reference, and that reference would be dangling. So the safest way is to have a single object. So that's why I have this transformation here. But the promise object itself, uh, to achieve the semantics of having the right-hand associative property, uh, we just pass around a tuple. Or something that a promise object that is implemented in its details, it has a tuple of these operations. So here's an example of this promise interface. Um, so there's a do that takes a, vi um, a variadic list of promises and it returns a promise. And you can see how that's, you can imagine how it's implemented. It would just take a promise and put all the sub-promises in a tuple and it would return itself. That's, that was really simple to implement. So promise FG was really easy. You just do do promise F, promise G. And then when you finally want to execute it with some input value, you have this final promise. Um, which is actually part of, like, in, in my implementation is, a, is an implementation detail. Uh, but that's what you would actually give the input value. So is everybody getting this so far? Is it completely obvious or are you completely lost? <laughs> All right. Um, so to create a promise that actually does something, yeah, we can give it a lambda that takes this callback resolve as a reference, so you don't have to capture it, um, and its input value. So this is the interface for promise. And it can do the same thing um, as before. It, takes, it checks some runtime condition, and it can resolve x or it can resolve some other error type. All right, so does anybody use the monadic interface or anything like a monadic interface, like in Boost HANA or um, member function chaining, anything like that? Yeah? I'll just assume now. <laughs> All right, so there's actually, I think there's two proposals for a monadic interface. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if they're competing. I think they have different use cases. Uh, this one. Um, P0650 R0 um, is based off of the Monadic interface in HANA, or it's very similar. It's not exact. Um, it's actually a little simpler. Um, and then there's the one that does chaining member functions. The chaining member functions is more readable, uh, typically because of the way people indent code, and uh, you don't have to deal with namespaces and whatnot. Uh, this Monadic interface that I'm showing you here. Um, all of these functions uh, return promises. So do returns a promise. Promise is obviously returns a promise. Uh, map. Uh, so instead of like transform where you give it a monad or a, a functor, you give it a mapping function and it returns a new functor. Map takes um, is, is like a high order promise function that you give it a mapping function. And it returns a promise that will compose that operation when, the, when it actually receives its input. So it's just a simple way of throwing map into like something like do. So everything is a promise. Tap is used for side effects. Um, and it just returns whatever value it, it was given. Um, so this promise interface, uh, promises have like three different sets of possible values, one being valid values, 
uh, another being error type values, which you just wrap in an error type. And then there's one other standalone um, value that it could receive called terminate, which can signal the end of a series or that, um, that uh, maybe an error occurred and you don't want to perform any of the other operations in the composition. The, the terminate can be a pass through to get to the end so that the cleanup can happen. All right? So map error would receive the error object, or not, it would receive the contents of the error object, and you could map on that. Map either, um, I haven't really used this one, it could take two lambdas that um, map on either the error or a valid value. And then map any is just, um, I, I use this in the implementation to map on the terminate um, when, when that's useful. And then catch error would catch an error. Um, uh, if it matches the type, and if it matches that specific error type, it would end up resolving as a terminate. Otherwise, it would just be a pass through. So, like I said, map returns a promise. So here, HANA is a promise tag. Uh, so this would be true. So the result of map, the object, is of uh, a, uh, a promise, as defined by the, the tag system that HANA uses. Um, so interestingly, if you do map ID, it's the same as promise lift. Uh, promise lift is just an alias to on a lift promise tag. So these are the same. So uh, in HANA, there's a monadic, the monadic interface, or to implement a monad, you can implement chain. And uh, it takes the monad object and a function that takes the input or the, the value inside the monad and it returns, it's required to return uh, a new instance of a monad which wraps whatever the result is. Uh, so HANA, Boost HANA also has what they, uh, what they call monad plus, which you have the concat function. So you can just like, let's say you take two tuples and you just concat them together. So does, does anybody see the problem with this? No? All right. Uh, so some people might argue that these couldn't be the same because P2 right here on the chain is supposed to be a function that takes the input and return a new promise. But so this is how you would normally call it. So chain, some, some promise, it takes an input value and it returns a new promise with some other result. All right, so this is, this is a monad. The problem with this is, is like let's say when you're creating this big blue blob thing, how do you know what the type of the, uh, the return promise is? And uh, if you have a lambda that takes something specific like an int, this is actually not too hard. But if it's a, if it's a, uh, a generic lambda, it can be very difficult. Uh, you would actually have to like invoke the function or use in, is invocable. Uh, but there's some problems with that. Um, in this case, what I do to just as a safety net, uh, I return, if I can't figure out what type it is, I return a type erased value that just holds this promise in place so that it, uh, it can be destroyed when, when the time is right and not before that. So here's my justification for making chain the same as cat. So a promise is a function that returns a promise. So I kind of cheated. I made it the same. Um, so it kind of has the dual role of not only is it a promise, but it can also be invoked as a function that returns a promise. So it's valid to be used in chain. And uh, so that makes it easy and efficient to figure out what the type is. I can just say, is it a promise? And I'll just store that type. And, and uh, the semantics make it the same. <coughs> 
So, so you know, it still receives an input value and it resolves it just like the training function does. And, it, and the result is a promise. All right, so this is where the monadic interface gets ugly. Uh, so when you chain off a value and you want to have like a sequence of chains, especially if you use like indentation with clang format or whatever, uh, it can look like an arrowhead. And this is uh, some of the arguments against the monadic interface proposal if, if we were to think of them as competing proposals. So here we, we lift, lift five as a promise and then we, we double it and then double it again. So we can flatten that using this do notation. And all it is is a function that takes uh, a variadic sequence of these promise objects, and uh, it puts them in a flat series. And this makes a much prettier interface. No, so th this is, uh, it would be nice. So um, the cool thing about this monadic interface is not that it's pretty to use, but in HANA you can just implement um, one either flatten or chain and you get a whole slew of other functions for free. So like with the chaining member functions, you could do the same thing with like CRTP and you implement maybe one or two member functions and then all the other functions like and then or, or else, or whatever, could be uh, probably just calling those other functions that were implemented by the customization. So, so do um, is just sitting on top of it. So nobody, like no user, would actually use the monadic interface directly. They would use something that sits on top of it that's a little more readable. Can I just ask you one question? <clears throat> so you're basically pipelining with all this. Is that, am I getting that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so uh, a monad yeah. <laughs> is, it's basically like a way of, it gives you the ability to take something that's in some kind of what they call a computational context. Mm -hmm. Really, in, in the case of promises, it's a value you don't know yet. So you could say it's an asynchronous context. So yeah, we're, we're basically just using, we're chaining these functions and the effects of the function is the, the result in this context that you can't get to until some, something happens. So yeah, so in this, in this case, you know, you, you make a connection. Once you have the connection, maybe there's a handshake. And you respond with some response with, to the handshake. You could parse an auth token and then, uh, in this case, keep reading would be some other nested promise that would do something in a loop. And then if it had an error, it would resolve as an error and then that would shut down. So yeah, so as long as these are doing something um, and it doesn't get to the end, this object is alive. So this is how um, the ownership issue is handled uh, internally, at least with a series of events. So um, with, uh, <laughs> with the actual execution of the promise, so we wanted to transform it into this big blue blob that's a single object. Uh, the interface is pretty much the same. It's the same as do, only run a sync does not return a value. Um, the idea is that we just do a series of asynchronous operations and then at some point we want to do some kind of side effects like writing to a socket or um, printing to the screen or something like that. But uh, if you don't want side effects, just keep chaining promises until, until you eventually do. Uh, so at the end, so like I said, uh, at the end of this promise chain, after catch error, the run async function will add this last operation, and it's input, it takes an input, it doesn't really care what the value is, but it does care that it's not an error. So, so um, 
at some point, like catch error, um, an error has to be mapped to something like a terminate object or some valid value. So this prevents the user from, from not handling an error uh, at compile time, locally. And then it deletes itself. Uh, I could have used like a unique pointer here, but it just seems kind of silly when all you're going to do is call like reset or something like that to have the object destroyed. It's kind of like its own asynchronous smart pointer. So for looping, and this is like pretend keep reading is like some member function. Uh, it calls run async loop. So instead of just doing a series of things and then quitting, it can do things in a loop on a series of events. And like it could check to see if um, like maybe the uh, socket is stopped. Uh, it could resolve a terminate, which would pass through all the way to the end, um, or an error, uh, and would pass pass to the error catcher. Um, and then you have this endpoint object that has a read message function that takes the state, as I showed you earlier, or the, the self, as I should have called it. Um, and it just keeps reading messages until it resolves an error. And inside this error ca catcher member function, um, this is where I was capturing a lambda that captures the shared from this, so it's guaranteed to always have uh, an instance of itself in this loop. So we don't have to do it all over the place in the implementation. All right, so at the end of the promise loop, it's a little different. So it does the same error um, handling. It has to catch an error. Uh, and if it's a terminate object, it's, it's done, it can delete itself. Otherwise, um, it looks, you know, this is like the implementation internal um, promise object, the big blue blob as I was referring to. It just calls it again with a new input value. And uh, if you don't have some kind of asynchronous operation, this could be an infinite recursive loop. So, so you have to give it some kind of a some kind of a resistance or a little spin out of control. All right. So asynchronous queuing. Um, so the reason for this, like I said earlier, um, when you write to a socket, like let's say you're writing messages and the user just calls messages, um, and you could have more than one, and they're all going to have to wait on the socket to actually write these, these messages. So you have to keep them somewhere. So the, the method is typically like you use STDQ, and, and when you write a message, you just store the message in the queue, and then you can flush the queue. So, uh, so and you can just you know, loop through the queue until it's done, and then it'll start to flush the queue again later when you, when you send another message. Uh, with an asynchronous queue, you need an asynchronous interface, and, and so what I do is like for STDQ, I can, I can wrap it in an asynchronous queue interface, but the user can also implement it themselves so that they can have these operations involve some kind of, uh, some kind of I.O. So for instance, like with RabbitMQ, uh, if you want something reliable, like let's say, let's say you're writing messages and you want them to persist on a disk or some some reliable queue somewhere. Uh, that's going to involve I.O. So that means you're sending another full duplex connection um, messages, and it has to have its own local queue as well. So, uh, so um, the idea is you also want them to be transactional. So lame 80s reference, but uh, so when you push a message, it goes into this, this uh, it pushes it to the queue, and then calls flush send queue, and it starts out in a loop. So the first thing it'll do is it'll check the size of the queue to make sure there's actually something in it. Uh, and then it calls the front function, which is a promise, and uh, which could 
You could be getting this from some distant thing like a RabbitMQ instance, for example. Um, so when it finally gets the message, it can resolve it. And then, you know, it calls the user send function. Um, and when, when that's complete and we know no errors occurred, we can pop it off the queue, which is also an asynchronous operation. So, so yeah, that just allows you to use a local queue or something that has a little more value um, if you need it. So you can actually have, like, let's say, a connection that's supposed to receive messages. And uh, if there's a disconnect, at least you know that you didn't lose any messages and you can uh, resume when they reconnect uh, if you can match up using some like session token or something like that. All right. So this is what it would look like to push in the implementation. You call run async, and it uh, you know lifts the message into this asynchronous context, and it gives it to the asynchronous queue, which uh, pushes it to the queue, and then uh, and then it calls the flush send queue, which will go in that loop until any messages that get added to the queue while it's working will also get uh, flushed as well, or sent as well. And the, the implementation for flush is, is a loop, like I showed you before. Uh, if it's done, it'll terminate. If the socket stops, it'll terminate. Um, then it asks the asynchronous queue for you know, the, the next message. Um, if it's stopped again, it'll terminate, <laughs> which could happen because we're waiting on some possibly long I.O. operation. Um, and then we actually call the user's write message um, function. And then uh, once it's done with the errors, we can pop it off the queue safely and then keep going. Um, front. So this is just an example of implementation for like STDQ. If it's non-blocking, it's local. There's not going to be any I/O or anything happening. It can just resolve the value using map. And uh, you know, obviously, you want to check at runtime, make sure it, there's never a condition that it could be the queue could be uh, empty. But we we do have a check before that. But just in case this gets used by itself, I guess. All right, so these endpoints. Um, we kind of already saw them. But uh, here's an example of a promise or a high order function. So you capture the self object, and you return a promise. So this is like a high order function that returns a promise, not a function. But it's effectively the same thing. Um, And what it does is it writes to an ASIO socket, or I'm sorry, it it, uh, it registers itself to to do an async connect using it on a, an ASIO TCP socket. And uh, when it's done, it just uh, resolves itself, or it resolves an error if there was an error. It's pretty simple. It's just like the bar function from before. Only it's actually doing something now, something useful. And uh, so this isn't something the user would typically have to deal with, or at least like the end user implementing an application. This is like libra library level stuff. So these endpoint classes, um, they take uh, these events, like init or read message or write message, uh, and you can compose them together. Uh, maybe they don't all do the same thing, but uh, in the case of acceptor or connector, this is part of the init event. So when you create this endpoint object, the first thing you want to do is either accept or connect the connection. And in the case of actually sending and receiving messages, you could just give it whatever. So this is just the basic semantics of it. Any questions? <laughs> 
You guys are killing me. All right. So to compose these, these endpoints are composable. I originally implemented it as like a monoid, uh, a HANA monoid, where you could like, uh, you know, call plus on it. And you could even create a sum of these. But uh, I ended up just making endpoint compose just compose it for you. And there's no, no fanciness except under the hood. So uh, the cool thing is, is uh, you can give it your own socket implementation to connect. And then um, in this top example, you have uh, sending a message using the ASIO T TCP implementation, which I'll show you later. Or you could send using WebSocket messaging. So the user has their own um, endpoint specification for how they want to handle messages, but they don't worry about the underlying implementation or, or the application layer. They just receive, well, probably a buffer. And they could compose that to like maybe marshal it and give them some object that they would be able to work with. So this isn't actually how it's implemented, but I just did this. Uh, to make it a little more readable. But the idea is, like I, I mentioned earlier, that write operations map um, high level to low level, and read operations map low level to high level. So in this case, when we compose these, the init um, also maps um, low level to high level. So um, in the case of init, you would just pretend t is high level and u is low level. In the case of init, usually you're waiting on some socket to receive a connection. And then maybe it does something else. Maybe it does a web socket handshake. And then finally, the user gets you know, this event called for them so that they, uh, they, uh, they can do something before it starts sending and receiving messages. So like maybe they want to say, hey, give me a session token, and they don't want application messages being sent back and forth until they have that information, uh, until their, their own idea of a connection is completely initialized. And then read message maps um, low level to high level. So it's the same thing, t to u. But with write message, it's backwards. Because uh, the user initiates the write message. They give their own object. And it gets mapped all the way down to some buffer um, and a socket operation of some kind. So is that terribly clever? <laughs> right, yeah, so that's me pointing out the mapping that's different for write message. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, my high level example for like the ASIO. If I, were, if I were to do like raw TCP messaging at, at my own like application level, I would need to, at, at the very least, know what the length of the message is going to be. I can't rely on like the TCP packets, because uh, the packets could be multiple packets. So I couldn't rely on the length of that. So I needed to send my own length. Um, in the case of that I implemented, it's just a fixed four bytes that specifies the length. Um, so it reads that fixed four bytes, and then it'll, in a new asynchronous read, it'll read the body. And we know what the length is, so we can wait until we receive all those bytes. So, so this is just how it's composed. Uh, the problem with, with this, and maybe it's trivial, but I don't like it, is that both of these operations are capturing self. So the capture, um, the cost of capturing Self as a reference is like eight bytes. So in our big blue blob, the more we capture, the more memory we take up, which maybe isn't such a big deal. But I think, I, I think we can get around it. All right. Uh, so the implementation of read length, it is, in this case, it's just a function that eventually gets wrapped as a promise. but it takes this callback and whatever input value. I don't think it cares in this case. 
what the input value is, but uh, it performs, performs an ASIO async read, giving it the socket that's contained within you know, the self object and a buffer of um, four bytes. It, this, this object is invocable as a function, but it owns its own buffer. So it's just a fixed four bytes. Um, and I encode that to some length value. And then I can resolve it as the length value, or if it's an error, resolve it as an error. All right. Uh, how many people here actually use ASIO, like regularly? Does this does this code look simpler or? It's been a while. Yeah. So this is like. It looks a lot better than my code. I'll just say. <laughs> I would say this is cleaner than some of the examples in the um, documentation of ASIO, but because all, you know you don't have to worry about ownership because the resolve is a reference. Uh, that's it's the ownership is handled elsewhere. Um, and the cool thing about this is once you have this, the, the user doesn't have to worry about it. So it's just this modular thing that you can plug in and compose separately. So it's a lot of times you'll, you'll see, uh, like in, in Beast's implementation, it's actually pretty clean, but it's just one big class with every operation that would call, um, which it's actually pretty read readable, but it's not as composable. Yes, so the idea of this library is that it's completely generic, and you don't even have to do socket communication if you don't want. Um, uh, with the exception is, like if in the, the looping, async loop, if you were to, like, not, like let's say you wanted to make a full duplex endpoint that just wrote messages, but it didn't read messages, so you didn't define read, um, I actually had the problem of it literally just being an endless self-recurring uh, loop. And it would just, you know, blow the stack. Um, but, you know, I can fix, prevent people from not defining a read handler. But there does seem need to be something that keeps it from just calling itself in its own context forever and ever. Uh, but yeah, that is the idea: protocol agnostic, socket agnostic, you know, transport agnostic. That's the idea. Oh, another example of a use case. Not just like serial communication, but uh, I wanted to do it for this presentation, but I didn't have time. Was like uh, in one of the reasons I couldn't use C++ for like uh, some command line interfaces I wanted to use is because I needed to be able to open or run shell commands and read, um, you know, different channels like std out and std um, error and uh, receive or you know send it values through stdin. Uh, so even communicating with the shell command. Uh, could be done using this full duplex interface. So I, I think this is a good way to harness the same, you know, g generalizing the same type of communication across any kind of uh, implementation or transport. So the, the implementation of body here, um, its input value is a length that it receives from the promise read, read length. And uh, in this case, it owns a string as a buffer because it's variable length, and it just resizes the string. So if it's the same size, it could be um, a cheap operation in that it just stays the same size. And then it reads, specifying the, the buffer length and uh, resolving either the body of the buffer as a string or an error. Um, so here's write message. Uh, so it's a function that returns a promise. It receives, it captures the, the state object if it wants. Um, and here it's write length, which uh, captures the socket in a different way because it, uh, I'll show you that in a sec. But uh, since the second promise does not have to own like any kind of buffer or object, it, it can just be a lambda. and uh, it receives the message as, as, as its input value, and it writes to the socket. And again, uh, resolves the message or 
an error. And, and the message gets passed down to like some implementation of, uh, well, I don't think there would be anything below this, below the TCP socket writing. Um, so WebSocket messaging. Uh, so I wanted to integrate Beast WebSockets with this. Uh, the problem is Beast WebSockets uh, async read function requires its buffer to be an L value reference, which is a little different from what ASIO is. I think ASIO used to be like that, but since its evolution with uh, keeping up with the network TS, um, they actually require this dynamic buffer object, which, um, like before, let's see here. So with async read, where is it? Oh, yeah. Huh. All right, so this slide's wrong, but you see where I'm calling ASIO buffer. It should be ASIO dynamic buffer. You guys should have caught me on that. <laughs> so um, with ASIO, so you have to keep the buffer object alive. But with ASIO, you, you have to, like, with a dynamic buffer, like std string, std string is not a dynamic buffer. But what you can do is wrap it in an object that is, and all it is is it's kind of like a reference wrapper. So the network TS actually requires that, um, well, that doesn't really show it, but the ASIO, or the network TS requires that a dynamic buffer be move constructible. So it has to take ownership of this dynamic buffer, even though it's only going to ever be some kind of reference wrapping object. So I kind of have beef with that. Um, I'm actually fine with just wrapping it. I, that's what I have been doing. But the problem with Beast WebSockets is I guess he came up with this dynamic buffer um, concept independently. And he does not require it to be move constructible. He requires the input to async read or any read operation to be an L value reference because it's upon the user to own the object. And uh, it's not like wrapped as a reference. So does anybody have a preference for whether or not it should be move constructible or not? <laughs> I think it should be both. I, I don't think they should have the constraint uh, in the network TS to require that it be move constructible and be a reference wrapped object. I think they should allow both, either a wrapper around like a string, which is easy because you can just hold your string. And then when you call async read, you just wrap it in this wrapper thing. And that's really easy. But in the case of, uh, in other cases, it's nice to just give it a reference to some buffer that you have that implements the dynamic buffer interface, except that it's not move constructible. Um, yeah, so this code that I showed you earlier works around that. So what I had to do, like to use Beast WebSockets with my string, and I wanted to give the user a string. That was the idea. STDQ string, they specify a queue of strings, so they should receive a string as a message. So in order to do that, I had to take their uh, Beast's flat buffer, and then I created a string view to it. And this isn't what, I talked to Vinny about this on chat, and he recommended some, probably cleaner, but this is what I came up with. Is I, I convert it to a string view, and then, uh, and then I copy it to the string, which is expensive, or could be expensive. It's, it's not as efficient as it could be. So that's, so that's Beast WebSockets. Hey, who's used Beast WebSockets? Nobody? All right, so it's actually really simple. If you know ASIO, ASIO is the hard part. WebSockets is, is simple. Um, so with WebSockets, uh, you just have this WebSocket thing that wraps a TCP socket, and it has its own async read function that hides the fact that it's, it's uh, reading, you know, handling all the data framing and stuff that WebSockets does. The problem is, is that it's glued to the protocol. But uh, yeah. All right, so oh, yeah. So we saw that. So if anybody from the standard ever sees this, I hope we can eventually have both. <laughs> because 
I think more general is better. If you don't need the restriction, why not? I think the reasoning is that uh, it's easier to document that it has to be some reference wrapped object. Um, so the right message for um, the WebSocket implementation, it's literally, so this, this state object, you just call async write. It looks exactly the same, only it's a, a WebSocket socket object. Um, all right, so at the user level, so like at above the application level, there's like the actual application. Um, the, uh, the user might want to have a message that would indicate the end of, you know, the series of events, or maybe it's just, you know, like signaling that, hey, close the connection. And in this case, it's just a string that's terminate. It could be, it could be some special type or even the terminate object. Um, but in this case, we check to see if messages terminate, and uh, we actually resolve it as the, the full duplex terminate object. And then, uh, oh yeah, another case, it just echoes the message. So this is just a really simple example of echoing the message uh, in a read message handler. Uh, I also supply an error message, so if an error occurs, at least it tells us that an error occurred and it shut down. Uh, Could you don't tail call? Is that using tail call recursion to resolve message in the else block? If you don't tail call that, will that blow the stack away? Oh, so there is a caveat to this interface in that you have to call the resolve function only once. Uh, if you don't call it, the object will just stay alive forever. So that's a huge problem. I think the way to solve that would best be using some kind of uh, external tool like static analyzer that looks in your functions and checks to make sure resolve is being called once. <laughs> but doing it in meta programming is almost too much work or it's just probably not feasible. Uh, so the full duplex has a send me message that you give um, you give your endpoint and you can just give it a message. Super simple. And that's that's all I got. Um, this is a list of uh, the references. Uh, I have the examples that integrates just the raw ASIO TCP. Uh, I also have some of that Rabbit MQ code and um, the Beast WebSocket integration inside this repo in my GitHub called uh, CPP Now 18 Full Duplex. Uh, and then the clean break implementation of this library uh, is in just a repo called Full Duplex. And you can see the other, the libraries that it uses, HANA, Beast, ASIO. And here's some of the mentioned um, libraries as well as the, the standards proposal. So there's that went pretty fast. There's 16 minutes left. Uh, anybody has any kind of questions, feel free to ask now. Yes? I'm curious about his question. Um, if you string a lot of these things together, uh, if you don't have the tail call optimization, can that become a problem, or is realistically it's never a problem? Because you're doing, from my understanding, I don't really know the terminology, is a continuation passing where you're given something that you invoke in order to you know, transfer control out. And if you have enough of those, can't you just blow the call stack? Yes, in practice, uh, you typically call some kind of asynchronous operation. So like I said, when I was, uh, I didn't define, I only defined a, an endpoint that would only write messages and I didn't define the read. And my library didn't care that you didn't define it. So it would certainly instantly blow the stack because it just called it in an infinite loop and there was nothing to stop it. The idea is that you would use this with some kind of blocking interface that would call the, the resolve function in, in a new asynchronous context, so it wouldn't actually be recursion at that point. Um, but it is useful to be able to chain some of these, maybe not a whole bunch. Um, but it, it, at that point, it isn't actually recursion. So uh, it's actually just 
the continuations, but in a loop, you definitely have to have something there to, to call it in a new context. When compared with something like a dead simple state machine listening to a serial interface, right. what will the runtime overhead be? Um, I, I would say that a, in addition to whatever implementation, the implementation of actually communicating would be, I would say, I would say it's zero cost as far as processing goes. The only overhead that, and I, I didn't measure it, but in theory it's zero cost. Um, the only overhead that I experience is one is that the run async involves its own allocation for the shared object. Um, right now my implementation has nested run async calls, but I can fix that. Uh, so it would be zero cost because, you know, if it's tied to the lifetime of the owning object, uh, I can just have it on, you know, not allocate on the heap and just allocate on some buffer inside the endpoint object. Uh, but as far as any processing, there's zero overhead. Just the, like the reference captures that I mentioned, if you have like two write operations that need access to the socket. But I think, I think that can be fixed too. But this is meant to be a zero cost abstraction. Yeah, so the problem with the, you know, I showed you the blue blob, the types get bigger and bigger. Uh, the error messages get really gnarly. Um, so especially like uh, when you're using GDB, it can be difficult to, to look at a backtrace. Um, or even just the error messages, is, uh, it's a big string of, you know, the big type and then the smaller type and then the smaller type and the smaller type. Uh, that's that's not a unique problem um, when you're doing a lot of meta programming, but with this clean break implementation I did with the lambdas, the lambdas did kind of clean up the errors, so you can kind of see more of a flat, instead of like this big blob, you see like a string of lambdas that's not like indented, and you can use the location of the lambdas to try to find where something's going wrong. Um, other than that, uh, the tap function can be used for like printf debugging, uh, and that's what I've been doing. But typically these things aren't too big and complex. Like, you know, it's just like, you know, sockets on top, web sockets on top of sockets, and then, you know, whatever you have after that, and then some side effects. Uh, so they don't get too gnarly in this use case, but I have some others that, like in a, in a state machine, where I'm accessing, doing introspection on, on values in some large structure, or nested structure, and I give it some like tuple for looking into that object. It uses promises, not these promises, but some other, you know, callback interface that uh, not only is it difficult to read the errors, but it also uh, increases the compile time by quite a bit. Yes. All of these lambdas you're using, you're not giving them names or anything. You're not defining them as variables. You get this very deep, when you're trying to read it as a parser, you're trying to understand it, like six months later, another person on your team is trying to read the code. Don't you find that they find it very difficult to understand it when you have no contextual information in the code anymore? It's almost like you've lost variable names and you've lost, like, what is this lambda supposed to do? You have to read the entire code in the lambda to understand the meaning of it. Obviously, you have to fit things into your slides. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so what do you do to make it more readable for, for production code, for, for big teams that have to work on the same code base? So the lambdas themselves, they're anonymous. Yeah. And as far as error messages go, they're actually pretty easy to track because the error messages, at least in Clang, um, give you the line number of where it's located. So I, I found, as far as debugging goes, the lambdas can actually be easier to find. Yeah. Um, Yes. Yes. So, with typically with lambdas or higher order functions, like in the cases that I showed you, um, well, this isn't a good, good example, but uh, so in this case, so we have lambdas here, 
this land has made right, named right message. And uh, it isn't so important that um, the that name. That provides contextual information. Yeah. Yes, yeah, on, um, honestly, yeah, I just, I look at the line number, I go to the code, and, and the context is, it's not, you don't need comments, but the context here is the name right message, which is above, you know, all this is complicated junk that I would not worry about after I wrote it, but at the top, it's right message. But um, typically, when you do high order function programming, I don't know if I have a slide that really shows that, but you would have like, a, maybe like a, a name, and then inside it is a lambda, and the lambda is just giving it functionality, but the name, yeah, that would give it like some, so, so some readability, but not, not from like um, an error standpoint other than just seeing the line number and going to it and seeing the context there. But that is, that is a good point. Uh, so I work by myself, so I don't typically worry about that so much. But <laughs> yes, there's there's some advantages to that. But um, in some cases, like specifically objects that needed to own, like the buffer, I used a name struct, and I usually append it with underscore fn, and then uh, um, it you know has the operator. So it can be invoked as a function. So it's effectively the same as a lambda. And then, uh, you know, under here, I would just have const expr um, and then read message equals, you know, read an instance of read message function. Or in this case, because it has state, uh, the person has to invoke it. Or I have a, a function that creates it that looks like I'm creating uh, an instance of a read message function. So there's, there's different strategies you can use, and I think it's more of a, yeah, you're right, it's stylistic and preference, but, yeah. Yes? Uh, did you try to integrate timeouts into an implementation of some protocol? Uh, I mean, uh, you cannot uh, wait infinitely when you uh, call a sync read for your a sync write. <coughs> So, Could you repeat the question? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess I totally spaced that. Um, so the question is, did I integrate timeouts to handle an asynchronous write operation taking like too long, maybe because somebody's dead on the other end? And then what you would resolve that as an error, I would suppose. Uh, so in this implementation, this library, full duplex, it doesn't worry about that detail. It's, it leaves it to whatever implementation. So this is simplistic. But if you wanted the reliability of, of, of handling a timeout, this is where you would do it. And you would just have a promise that does an asynchronous write. And uh, um, yeah, you would, you would have to handle um, the, yeah, I guess. So you'd have to handle the, the case of the write completing and the timeout completing. Could they both be? Right, but so the the to handle them all, not to like using a sync right, but just in some different place. So you you need uh, usually your context to make this timer, and you need to. What is the context? Right. So like the socket object. Uh, no, not the socket object. No. So if you're doing a timeout, would it be much different than just you know, saying timeout and then you have an event handler when that timeout completes, right? All right, so maybe 
I'm not prop as experienced implementing that sort of technique, but what I can say is that that is a detail that's left in this junk right here. And so you would just wrap that in a promise. And it would either resolve the result of a success or an error. If the, you know, if it was a timeout, you would resolve an error. The, the result of creating the timeout or the result of the timeout itself? So I, I'm, from what I understand, you would create the timeout and it would return immediately and then you would do your async, right, is that correct? Or am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Right, but you don't wait on it. You do an asynchronous operation, and then it just immediately you go on to the next thing. Not immediately. So you just run two asynchronous operations uh, simultaneously, and uh, you you can have one completed by another completed. Right. Yeah. So you'd have two outstanding event handlers. Yeah. So that would be. Um, I don't know how difficult that would be to do. Um, safely, uh, you could at very least just handle it as an implementation detail in here, but that would be very interesting to add a utility to this library that would handle that for you. That would be very, very interesting. So maybe we, maybe we talk about that later, but we're pretty much out of time. Is there any other questions? We've got about two minutes. All right, so uh, thank you for coming down. I know you had a choice and, uh, and uh, going to whichever talk you wanted to. and. Uh, I do appreciate you coming down. Thank you.